Yeah. <laughs> He's sitting still. He looks ready. He's not moving. Huh? All right. Go for it. Watch what you say. All right. All right. Uh, Revelation chapter seven. We finally move into chapter seven. <laughs> Let me say right up front. Uh, uh, so, some of you will be uh, very uh, left unfulfilled today. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask two very big questions as we go through here, and I'm not going to answer either one of them. Uh -huh. uh, that that will be uh, that will be next week. So if you if you plan not to be here next week, you're going to miss out the answers to those two questions. Uh, so that's the cliffhanger. All right, so. We start in uh, Revelation chapter 7, uh, uh, we start to hear about the 144,000, which we have talked about before. Uh, we're going to get into that today, and uh, and also the, the great multitude in, in verse 9. So, but let's start at verse 1, and uh, let's make sure we get into uh, this correctly. So, uh, let me just read it. It says, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. So first of all, um, you notice that it says, um, well, let me see, before we, before we, <laughs> before we dive into that, um, remember that where we are. So we were, uh, in, in chapter 6, we went through the opening of the seals. Uh, we had opened the sixth seal. Um, we had... Uh, <clears throat> There are seven seals, but we're right here in the middle of opening the seals. We opened up the sixth seal, and we ended up in the, in verse chapter six, verse seventeen, with this question: Who is able to stand in the the great day of wrath? And as I said last week, uh, uh, chapter seven is kind of uh, put in here to answer that question: Is who is able to stand? Um, so I want to just look at a couple things before we get into actually into verse one of chapter seven. I want you to go back to Thessalonians. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. As we've talked before, Thessalonians also has a lot to say about the end times, and I just want to look at some of that here. So verse five, uh, chapter five, verse one says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you for you yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord. So comes as a thief in the night. So let me just, before I finish, um, the day of the Lord is a, is a phrase that's used over and over in scripture. Um, and I just want you to recognize that when we open the sixth seal, uh, the sixth seal, uh, we are beginning the day of the Lord, okay? That, that's the, the beginning of the day of the Lord is in the sixth and seventh seal, as we'll see as we get into the further chapters. But when we open the sixth seal, we're into the sixth, we're into the day of the Lord. So verse three, I'm still in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verse three. It says, for, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So you remember also that we talked last time about the, the first horse, or two times ago, the first horse all being about peace and safety. And he's saying when that happens, that's the first, that's the first sign of the end times. Then sudden destruction comes upon them. That's the rest of the the rest of the seals through verse six that we've seen. Skip down in chapter five, skip down to verse nine. <clears throat> it said, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, and whether we wake or sleep. We should live together with him. So the point here is wrath is coming, right? We saw that in verses one through three here. But he's saying God did not appoint us for wrath. Uh, those of us who are saved uh, will be kept from the wrath, will be saved from the wrath because of our salvation. And then verse 10 is an important verse. It says, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Uh, so uh, wake or sleep, he's saying whether we are dead or alive, uh, we live together with him, right? And that's going to be important as we get into uh, what we're going to talk about here in Revelation. Uh, turn the page over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
verse 6, of a similar verse, says, since it, is, since it is a righteous thing that God to repay you with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So, so again, just those two verses, you know, he's going to repay those uh, with tribulation who trouble you and those of you who are with Jesus, uh, he's going to give you rest. And go to verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day, again, this day of the Lord, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believe. So again, it's bringing all those concepts together again. Um, skip over to, to chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. It says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. So the lawless one, again, the Antichrist, right, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, and they, will, and, they, and they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So again, you talk about the deception, right? The false peace of the first horse, and that they're all going to be condemned for not, for believing in that false peace. Um, now, so, so the other thing that this says is that the ungodly will not survive this wrath of God, but the godly will survive the wrath of God, right? Um, so turn one more thing, go back to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi, last book in the Old Testament, chapter 3. Malachi 3, verse 16, <clears throat> 16 through 18. Mine reads this way. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, <clears throat> and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance, <clears throat> excuse me, so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. So here again, we have this promise that God is going to spare those who are his. Uh, their names are written in this book, right? And that he, uh, he, protects, he protects his own in the midst of his wrath. And we've seen this over and over in God, right? Um, we saw it with the flood, right? He protects Noah. We saw it, uh, you know, Lot's family is protected as Sodom and Gomorrah is, is uh, destroyed. We take Moses and the Israelites going through the Red Sea when uh, all the Egyptians are destroyed. So this is, uh, uh, th this is a, a common practice of God to protect his own. So that, that is exactly where we are. And let's go back to Revelation. This is exactly where we are in Revelation where we have the great, and final wrath, the, the great tribulation coming, and we hear, see here in chapter 7 uh, this protection. All right, so again, I read uh, chapter 7, verse 1. The first thing I want to point out is, is the mind starts out after these things. Uh, that's kind of a key phrase uh, in Revelation. Uh, it, it, it introduces a new vision. If you go back to chapter 4, verse 1, uh, when we looked at the throne room of heaven, the first thing it says is, after these things, uh, I looked and behold, right? He, he sees the, the new vision of the throne room. Here, here in chapter 7, then he says, after these things I saw, again, this is introducing a new vision that John has. So, so he's in the middle of a vision here uh, in chapter 6, right? This vision of the seals, uh, of the throne room of Christ and of the seals. And in the middle of that vision, he has this uh, parentheses vision, if you will, uh, right in the middle of it. And that's what we're going to uh, look at uh, today and, and next week. So after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. 
So uh, where are the four corners of the earth? North, south, east, and west. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's a little bit of a trick question, right? Uh, I mean, the, the earth, I think, is still round or approximately round. Uh, yeah, so uh, it, it, if you remember when we talked about this uh, all the way back in Daniel, the four is the number of the earth. Um, and so when we talk about the four corners of the earth, it just means the whole expanse of the earth. And as Danny said, it's also uh, connected often with the compass points, northeast, south, and west, the four corners. Uh, it, you know, it, it, again, it's just talking about the whole earth here. So here you have these four angels standing uh, at the four corners of the earth, holding back the winds. So these are incredibly strong angels that are holding back the winds. Now, what are these winds that they're holding back? Any thoughts? Judgment. Yeah, it's judgment. Go over to uh, chapter 8 for a minute and look at, uh, we, we looked at this first before. Yeah. Give Kim a star. Uh, go go to <clears throat> chapter 8, verse, what did I say? Five. In fact, go back to verse 4, chapter 8, verse 4. It says, And the smoke of the incense of the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. And then the angel took the censer filled with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquakes. So here what you have, um, let me, let me read, go back to chapter 7, verse, uh, verse 2 a minute. We didn't read that. Let me read it again. Let me read it. It says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth and the sea. So here you have these four angels whose job it is actually to pour out this censor, to pour out this judgment. And, and they are actually standing and holding back that judgment. Holding, uh, they're holding back the four winds, the winds that are going to blow and, uh, and blow judgment upon the earth. Uh, their job is to uh, harm the earth and the sea, um, and and they're being told here to 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 hold it for a few minutes, all right, <laughs> for a while. Anyway, um, he, he's telling it to hold. It, it, it's and it's really what's being held back. Um, if, if you go on, is the seventh seal, right? The seventh seal then comes uh, a little bit later, as we see in chapter eight. We'll see the seventh seal. So he's, he's saying, wait for the seventh seal. There's something else that I need to do here. So in chapter, in verse 2, we see that there's this other angel ascending from the east. Any idea who this angel is? Gabriel. Going with Gabriel. Gabriel, right. Going with Gabriel. Or Gabriel. Gabriel. Yeah. Let's have a vote. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I don't have a clue who this angel is. Um, <laughs> the, only, <laughs> the only thing I would say, uh, there are some commentators who say this is Christ. I don't think this is Christ. I think it's an angel. It says it's an angel. I believe it's an angel. Uh, you got four. You got the uh, four angels there holding the four corners. You got another angel that's ascending here from the east. I will say, um, so from uh, from where John is, if he's looking east, what is he looking at? Rising sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What country? Depends on where you're standing. Well, where <laughs> Where is John? He's on Patmos, right? He's on Patmos. He's looking east. Where is Israel? Where's Patmos? Yeah. He's seeing, he's looking at Israel, right? He's looking at Jerusalem. This one is who's rising from the east is coming out of Jerusalem. He's trying to get your geography straight there. Right? He's on the isle in the Mediterranean. He's looking east, which would be Israel. Uh, he's looking towards Jerusalem. And, uh, and he sees this. Uh, he sees this angel uh, ascending from uh, from there. Um, now he has with him a uh, a signet ring, right? I saw this angel ascending from these, having the seal of the living God. What's really talking about there is, you know, his. Uh, it's that same seal that they use to to uh, press hot wax on letters, right? It's that kind of a seal, you know, like a signet ring. It's the the seal that shows that this is God's authority. He has, he's bringing with him God's authority, is what it's really saying here. And so he, he has the seal. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and saying, do not harm the earth or sea or trees till we have sealed the servants of our God 
on their foreheads. So I say, wait, do not break that seventh seal. Do not allow the rest of the judgment to occur until actually we seal the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now, um, you know, what's interesting is you know well uh, the mark of the beast, right? Uh, that you, that uh, people in this time were gonna get the mark of the beast. It was a, it was a mark on their foreheads so that they could uh, uh, do commerce, so they could buy food and all that. What's interesting is we don't know as well uh, the mark of God, uh, the sealing of God on the foreheads of the servants. Somehow that one is not as clear. Uh, but this, this, this is a, a very important statement here that the servants of God here are sealed, are marked on their foreheads so that they can be turned, so they can be, what's the word? You can tell them apart <laughs> from those who do not follow Christ, right? Um, I do want you to go back to uh, Ezekiel chapter 9 and show you a similar passage. So Ezekiel, if you go to Daniel and turn left to get to Ezekiel, so Ezekiel chapter 9. Of course, if you find Ezekiel, then Daniel's to the right. Um, Ezekiel's a bigger book, bigger book than Daniel. Ezekiel chapter 9. <clears throat> Okay, Ezekiel 9, we'll start at verse 3. It says, Now the glory of God of Israel had gone up from the cherub, where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed in linen, who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations are done within it. So first of all, he's saying, Go through the city, and all of them who are upset about what is going on in Jerusalem, about all these people who are worshiping idols and not following after the Lord, uh, for all of those who are actually staying uh, with me, who are following after God, I want you to put a mark on their foreheads. Then look at verse 5. <clears throat> and to the others, he said in my hearing, go after them through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men maidens and little children and women, but do not come any but do not come near anyone who has the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple, et cetera, et cetera. So here you see another similar thing in Ezekiel uh, where they actually marked the followers of God and then they went in and killed everyone else. Uh, mm -hmm. This is this is uh, so so this this mark on the forehead is a symbol of protection. It's a symbol of God's favor. It's a symbol of indicating who, who is with God and who is not. So we're going to quickly get into the 144,000 here in the next verse. Uh, well, let's go ahead and read it. Verse 4 says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the chil children of Israel were sealed. Verse 5, of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Gad, 12,000. Asher, 12,000. Naphtali, 12,000. Manasseh, 12,000. Simeon, 12,000. Levi, 12,000. Issachar, 12,000. Zebulun, 12,000. Joseph, 12,000. And Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. So here we have this 144,000. And the, and the first uh, big question today is, who are they? Who are these 144,000? And why is it important for us to understand who they are? So I want you to go to chapter 14 a minute. There's only two places where these 144,000 are talked about here in chapter 7 and then over in chapter 14. So let's look at, at what it says there about the 144,000 in chapter 14, beginning of verse 1. It says, then I looked and behold a lamb standing on the uh, standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Right. So this is exactly what we've seen. Uh, they were sealed. And now we see Christ coming with them. Verse two. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing in their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women. They are virgins. These are the ones who followed the lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed among men. 
being first fruits of God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So there's some clues in there. There's some information in there about this 144,000 to help us try to figure out who they are. Um, so you know we have this uh, you know we we we, um, we have this this first indication. We'll go back now to Revelation seven. Uh, we'll get to fourteen later, but go back to fourteen seven. Certainly, uh, in verse four, it says that these are of the tribe of the children of Israel, and then we have the listing of the of the twelve tribes. I will ask this question: um, Do you notice anything funny about the list of twelve tribes? Yes. Go yes, ahead. What, is, what do you see? Well, when you go back and look at the 12 tribes in the Old Testament, uh, Joseph is not one of the 12 tribes. His two sons were. And one of the other uh, tribes is missing. The tribe of Dan is missing. Right. So this is an interesting and uh, funny list here that we have. So Dan is missing. Uh, Dan, uh, 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 the, the whole tribe of Dan went to follow idols, and it's believed that they're not on this list because they are no longer following after God. Uh, Joseph, uh, as, uh, as Bill said, had two sons, uh, Manasseh, who is in the list, and Ephraim, who's not in the list. Normally in the list of 12, you have Manasseh and Ephraim listed, Joseph's sons rather than Joseph himself. But here you have Manasseh, but you don't have Ephraim. Again, uh, Ephraim, uh, uh, if you go back to the Old Testament, you'll see that they also followed after idols. And so Joseph is actually replaced here uh, in place of Ephraim. But then, as I said, Dan is also not here. And what's interesting is who is here, who's normally not on this list, is Levi. Levi uh, is the, the priestly family, uh, normally not in this list because he was not given land, right? This is the a list of who was given land. Levi was not given land, but we got a hole because we took Dan out. So they slipped Levi in <coughs> because also at this point in time in history, there's no need uh, for the priestly family, right? You're now, uh, uh, you know, at the end time, there's no priestly family needed. There's no sacrifices uh, that they're going to be made during this time. So it's a very interesting list, uh, uh, quite divergent from uh, uh, the other lists in the Old Testament. I will say that the lists in the Old Testament uh, are not all the same either, because again, uh, some of these events that occur when um, one family got in trouble, etc. The other thing that you need to think about is that when uh, you remember that at a point in history uh, when Israel actually split in half, and there was the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom, right? And the northern kingdom, where most of these tribes uh, uh, when it, uh, actually left uh, following after Christ, and all that was left was Judah and, um, and um, Benjamin. I knew there was a word there it is in my head. Okay, they were all that was left. So you might say, well, gee, wouldn't it just be for those two tribes? Um, uh, but, but actually, he has, uh, he has he's brought all of the, uh, all the tribes in here. The other thing interesting in this list, if you go to verse five, the first person listed is Judah, uh, but Judah was not the oldest son. Uh, who was the oldest son? This is a quiz. Reuben. Reuben. Yeah, Reuben was the oldest son, but Reuben, if you, again, if you go back and remember, Reuben actually lost his birthright, uh, and it was turned over that Judah became then the the eldest son uh, according to birthright. So. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't spend the time to go back. And, I didn't spend the time with you to go back and look at all the places in the Old Testament where these things occurred. But, uh, hey, but uh, I had a question uh, on, on this. On, on verse 4, uh, when it says, Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, and it says 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Is it possible it means including that? Um, and any interpretation. So, you know what I mean? Is, is it possible they're saying, hey, there were 144,000 from the tribes of Israel, but there were more? Or to, I don't, I don't, I have no idea what the interpretation <clears throat> reads or anything, but. So, so as I, as I said early on, I'm not going to tell you today who the 144,000 are. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I was just curious. But, I didn't but that's know if it read that way or I not. That's an interesting piece of that. That's that is a part of the thinking in the, in the interpretation. Is that point, uh, Hugh? I'm, I'm not dismissing it, 
I'm just trying not to get to the the final answer yet. Because as you know, I, I won't have a final answer anyway, but we'll we'll talk about that next week. There's lots of interpretations of the 144,000 as to who they are. I'm just trying to lay out for you the scope of it, and then we will come back and actually try to answer that question next week. To me, there's there's two really good answers, and we'll we'll talk about that next week. All right. So having said all that, so we we you know the, there is this discussion about the Israelites. We um um. It, Let's see, I'm trying to figure out where I go here. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I'm going to hold that till next time. So go to verse nine. Um, so so we, then we'll, we'll, so here in verse nine, what's interesting here is that, let me read it to you. It says, after these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number of all the nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hand, crying out with a loud voice saying salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. So here again in verse nine, if you notice, it starts out with after these things. And as I said, when we first started, uh, that phrase means a, a new vision. So here in the midst of the new vision that we have in chapter seven, we have another new vision. We have another parentheses within the parentheses within the parentheses, <laughs> okay? And those of any of you who know uh, anything about math know you have to start with the innermost parentheses uh, before you can understand the other outside parentheses. So that's why I'm not giving you the answer to the uh, middle parentheses, uh, which is really uh, verses one through eight. We really have to understand verses nine uh, 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 through through 17 before we can understand verses one through eight uh, and clarity around the uh, 144,000. So we have this new vision. Um, uh, he says, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number of all the nations, tribes, people's tongues, standing before the throne, before the lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. So um, notice again, I, I told you to watch out for the word behold. Uh, we see it here again. After these things, I looked and behold. Right? So he's saying, wow, this is shocking. This is just amazing that all of a sudden uh, we see uh, this great multitude. Um, I, I typed into my notes, kabam, you know, all of a sudden we have the notes and the, and the, uh, the, um, the thing that fixes your spelling, put the word kablam. There's no word kabam, but there is a word kablam. Uh, that, that's additional information just for you to know that. Anyway, uh, uh, but, but, but the point is, you know, all of a sudden here we're seeing, you know, we, we, uh, he's hearing about this 144,000, and all of a sudden he sees this giant multitude in front of him. Uh, uh, dazzling, brilliant wh white robes that they're in. Um, these white robes are reminiscent of the white robes back in chapter 6 of the martyrs underneath the altar. Remember them? Uh, what happened to them? They were given white robes, right? And here we have these folks all of a sudden coming in white robes. Uh, palm branches, everything else. There's this amazing celebration going on. Uh, they're standing before the throne. Uh, now they're not, uh, you know, it's not like those others who were underneath the altar. These are standing before the throne. Again, I, I want you to capture the picture here of this uh, giant multitude uh, uh, that no one could number uh, standing in the midst of the throne uh, again, with the you know, with God on his uh, on his throne, with the rainbow overhead, the four living creatures zooming about, the crystal sea. Uh, I, I mean, this has got to be. Th this is why the word "behold" is in there, right? It's like, holy cow! Look at the, what is going on here. All of a sudden, we're seeing this, and 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 you've got to you've got to recognize that what you're seeing here is a massive revival, right? You're seeing a massive revival of uh, a great multitude uh, who who are um, who are saved at this point they're, they're crying out about salvation they're crying out about uh, uh, salvation these, these are these are, are people that are saved a great multitude from every nation from every people every tongue uh, now standing before the throne is a great multitude of saved people here um, I want you to see back in um, Matthew chapter 24. 
you know that we keep looking at Matthew 24 because it's a, again a very uh, very much a sequence of events of what's going on in the tribulation. Look at verse 14. Matthew 24, 14. This, um, Twenty-four, fourteen. Mine says, "And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, and then the end will come." Right? There is this, there is this great preaching. There is this great revival that happens uh, right before the end comes, and we're about to get to the end. Right? We're in the sixth seal. When we get to the seventh seal, we're at the end. So he's saying, right before the end comes, there's this great preaching. There's this great witness. Uh, there's this great revival. Uh, there's this great multitude uh, that comes to, to Christ. The other thing I've got to show you is way back in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. I know it's in my Bible somewhere. I just want to look at verse 1, actually. <clears throat> Genesis 12, 1 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, who, of course, you know, becomes Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who curse you. I'll curse him who curses you, and, all, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So part of the part of the promise given to Abraham was that he and his people would be a great people. But the other part of the promise is that he would bless the rest of the nations. He would bless the rest of the world. And this is repeated over and over in the Old Testament, that not only will Israel be a great nation, but that they will be a blessing uh, to the rest of the world. And we and we are seeing <clears throat> this come to pass in these verses where we have these this multitude um, uh, that that is coming uh, that is coming to the Lord. Now, I'm I'm trying not to answer your questions. Verse ten. Uh, so 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 what are they doing? Uh, in verse ten, they're crying out with a loud voice, saying, "Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb." So again, they're crying out about salvation. They're praising God. Uh, they're praising uh, they're praising the Lamb. And then in verse eleven. It says, and all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So here you have this, uh, this multitude, this great, gigantic multitude that is uh, uh, that is worshiping God, saying salvation belongs to our God. Then they are then this uh, the rest of heaven, uh, which includes the angels, uh, the elders, the four living creatures. They all fall on their face, faces, on their faces uh, before the throne and worship also. So you have this uh, this massive worship going on. Uh, you have the worship of the multitude, and then you have the worship of the rest of the <coughs> the rest of the beings in uh, in heaven. Now, um, I want you to go back and look at uh, uh, Luke chapter 15. Because y'all need to get something here that's really, 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 really important. Luke chapter 15. Uh, some familiar verses, verse 7. <clears throat> right? Luke 15, 7, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Skip down to verse 10. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. With that as background, I want you to go back to what we see here in Revelation, right? You see this multitude of sinners who are coming to repentance and how, who are praising God for their salvation. And then in verse 11, you see the response of heaven, 
right? The response of heaven uh, is, is in verse 12, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor, power and might be to our God forever and ever, right? You see the joy and rejoicing in heaven over this multitude of people uh, that are coming. Uh, it's, it's a response uh, from heaven uh, to what, uh, to the salvation of this multitude. Now, <clears throat> I think uh, I'm going to do something a little weird here, so get ready. Uh, I think what's going on here is, um, have, ever, have you ever been in a service, and um, um, Denise is not here today, but have you ever been in a service where there are, where there are two choirs, and they kind of sing back and forth to one another, right? One sings one part, and then the other one sings the other part, right? I actually think that's exactly what's going on here. I think you have the great multitude singing, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And then you have the angels responding, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor, power and might be to our God forever, amen. And then you have the multitude saying, salvation belongs to our God. And it's just going on and on and on and on. And this amazing, uh, I think the word is antiphony. I looked it up. Uh, this antiphony where they go back and forth and back and forth. Um, <clears throat> so I would actually like us to try that this morning. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so what I want to do is the people on the left side of the room, which is on Debbie's side of the room, all right, I want you to be the multitude. All right? So I want you to uh, say salvation. <clears throat> and I don't care what's in your version. Say what's ever in your version. Right, but salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the people on the right hand side, on Kim's side, right, I want you to read verse 12. Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor, power and might to obey God forever and ever. Amen. You got it? <clears throat> and I want us to do it three times. I want us to start with a normal voice. And then it actually says that they were crying out with a loud voice. When we get to the last time, I want it to be loud. I want the people next door to wonder what is going on in there. <laughs> All right, so we'll start with the left, and I'll I'll kind of lead you. I'll kind of lead you along, but you, you understand your part. Yep. Yes, sir. All right. So here we go. On the left, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. On the right. On the right. Amen. Blessing. Amen. Glory, Praise wisdom, Praise thanksgiving, Praise honor, Praise honor Praise power, Praise and honor. be Praise for God Praise forever and Praise ever. Praise Amen. Amen. Salvation, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. You know, we're going to be doing that for eternity. Yeah. Right? You know, if you're a little uncomfortable doing that, get over it. <laughs> this is what we're going to be doing for eternity. It's just praising God. Uh, for what he has done. And I, I, I just, I don't know, when I, when I got to that and just recognized that this is angel, this is heaven rejoicing over the salvation of this multitude, I, it just gave me chill bumps up and down my spine to just see heaven rejoicing as, these, as this great multitude comes to him, as this great multitude comes into heaven. And, and then this, this unending worship uh, begins and continues, right? We saw this worship back in chapter five, um, you know, uh, growing and growing, and we see it even more growing here uh, as this multitude comes in and joins the chorus uh, and and uh, and begins this worship. <clears throat> so I'm actually going to stop here. Um, if, if we go to verse 13, well, I'm going to read verse 13, uh, which says, and then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these crazy people, who multitude that just came in? Uh, and just showed up and uh, and are in these white robes. Who are these people? Mine doesn't say crazy people, but <clears throat> right. Who who is this multitude? Uh, he asked John. John says, "Hey, I don't I don't have a clue. You you know who these people are." And then he goes on and answers that. So 
I want to start there next time. <clears throat> so we got two questions hanging over us. Really, who is this multitude? Who is this multitude of people that have been saved? And then, and then we have to back up to, okay, then who are the 144,000? Because we have uh, we have all of them together, kind of singing this this massive praise as we get into uh, verse 11 and uh, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, so who is this group? Who is this full group of the uh, uh, the 144,000, the multitude? Then we also got to go back and say, remember uh, who the elders were. Uh, we got the four living creatures, right? Uh, we got to kind of figure all that out to understand who uh, who this group is that's in heaven. We have some clues as we get into the rest of chapter seven, uh, but we're also gonna have to look at some other places to, to get this clarity. All right, so anything before, I, I know I, I've stopped a little early, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna jump into the next piece because we wanna save that for next time. <clears throat> Not that it makes a big difference, but why in, four, in uh, verse two, he doesn't include trees, but in verse three, he does include trees as far as what they can harm. I just thought that was funny, too, about the trees. I have no idea, and I have no comment. I actually looked that up because I was. <laughs> it's one of those weird things that jumped out at me, too. And none of the commentaries say anything about the trees. So I don't, I don't If you come up with a good answer for the trees, I'd like to hear it because I don't, I don't have a clue what the, what the deal is with the trees. Have you, have you seen the movie Lord of the Rings? I don't know which one it is, but they have a. There's <laughs> one that they go talk to the trees, and the trees make them do the battle. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll leave that to you to figure that out. <laughs> All right. Uh, Y'all have a good prayer time. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Appreciate what you're doing there. We'll talk to y'all later. Bye now. Bye. 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 Bye.